All right, now we begin with the next chapter. It is sort of strange for you that the very last to the very fag end of the course, you know, I am starting a new chapter, but you have been asking me questions about variable coefficient ODEs, right? We have been solving constant coefficient ODEs. We hardly ever solved a variable coefficient ODEs except when one solution is known, etc. How do you know that sin x upon root x is a solution of this equation or how do you know that 3 x minus 4 x cube is a solution of that equation, etc. Right? So, the one example we will take of a differential equations with variable coefficients. So, which equation do you think I am going to take? Cauchy-Euler equation we are done, finished. We are going to take the Bessel's differential equation. The Bessel's equation is the, is the second most important or maybe one of the two most important equations of mathematical physics, the Bessel and the Legendre. I take, choose the Bessel's functions. Okay. So, the title of the chapter is Bessel's functions of the first kind. Bessel's functions of the first kind. That is the chapter title. All right. So, recall Bessel's OD. What is Bessel's OD? 6.1 x squared y double prime plus x y prime minus p squared y equal to minus x squared y. I have written this differential equation with the minus x squared y on the right hand side. As the, as the differential equation suggests, the left hand side is a Cauchy Euler equation which we completely understand and the right hand side can be thought of as a perturbation term. So, the Bessel's equation is a perturbation of the Cauchy Euler equation. How do you solve the Cauchy Euler equation? Find the indicial equation, find the roots of the indicial equation. What is the indicial equation for this? m into m minus 1 plus m minus p squared. That is m squared minus p squared equal to 0. So, the solutions are x to the power p and x to the power minus p. So, this suggests that if the, if the Bessel's equation is going to be a perturbation or the Cauchy Euler equation, we should look for a solution for the Bessel's equation near the origin because the perturbation at the origin, no? the right hand side is small only when x is near 0. So, this suggests that we should seek a solution of the Bessel's equation in the form, in the form x to the power p y 1, y 1 tilde and x to the power minus p y 2 tilde. This is the uh, suggestion what I mean if you believe that the perturbation that it that the Bessel's function is a perturbation of a Cauchy Euler equation, right? Where that solution should behave like x to the power p and x to the power minus p near the origin. Well, if it is going to behave like x to the power p and x to the power minus p, then y1 of y1 tilde of x should not be 0 at the origin and y2 tilde of x should not be 0. Because if y1 tilde of x is 0 at the origin and if y1 is analytic, then y1 is behaving like x into something. Then the, then, the, then the dominant behavior changes. So, we are going to assume that y 1 tilde and y 2 tilde are not 0 at the origin. So, that the behavior is like the uh, Cauchy Euler equation of which it is a perturbation. That is the uh, assumption with which we are going to start. Okay, we are going to begin with that, with that assumption and then we are going to look at the possibilities whether we do indeed succeed in getting a solution or not. Okay. We have to get the solution and you have to check that it is indeed a solution. That job is there. Physical considerations may suggest something. Various suggestions can come, for, uh, come forward, but then can we, can we put forth. But we have to check at the end of the day that it all works. All right. So, let us start with the with p bigger than 0. Let us start with p bigger than 0. p is a real number and the two roots p and minus p. So, we will take the larger one. So, we will look for a solution of the form y 1 x equal to x to the power p y 1 tilde of x, where y 1 tilde of x should be analytic. That means that y 1 tilde of x will be a power series sigma a n x to the power n and along with this x to the power p it becomes the whole thing becomes 
n from 0 to infinity a n x to the power n plus p. Now, I already told you that y 1 tilde should not be 0 at the origin, because if it were 0, then the dominant behavior is getting disturbed, then the dominant behavior will become x to the power p plus 1 and we do not want that. We want the thing to behave like x to the power p. That means that a naught should be non-zero. The other assumption I am going to make. So, now two assumptions we have made that the solution that we are going to look for is of the form sigma n from 0 to infinity a n x to the power n plus p, where a naught is not 0. Is this clear where such a ansatz is coming from? Where such a hypothesis is coming from? Why this formulation? Why this particular formulation? Because we have our, our point of departure is that the Bessel's function, Bessel's OD is a perturbation of the Cauchy Euler OD. That has been our point of departure, and in accordance with this, this is the ansatz that y of x is x to the power p sigma n from 0 to infinity a n x to the power n. Once again, this is just a formulation, this is just an ansatz. We have to solve the thing and you have to check. Whether we do uh, whether we do get a power series solution or a, uh, for for the differential equation, correct? All right. So now so differentiate this twice and multiply by x squared. So what is going to happen? N from zero to infinity, n plus p, n plus p minus one, a n x to the power n plus p x squared y double prime x squared d 2 by d x squared is a degree preserving operator. Remember when we studied the Cauchy Euler equation, that is why when you apply you again get back the x to the power n plus p. Same is the case with x y prime, you get back x to the power n plus p and the coefficient of course becomes n plus p a n. Just as when you feed in x to the power m into the Cauchy Euler equation, x d d x applied to x to the power m is m x to the power m. Right. Same thing, m x to the power m. See that happening? And minus p squared y is minus p squared a n x to the power n plus p. Now to add these three things together, what will happen? n plus p the whole squared minus n plus p plus n plus p goes away, and you get n plus p the whole squared minus p squared. Correct? All right. So after substituting into the ODEs, we get sigma n from 0 to infinity n plus p the whole squared minus p squared a n x to the power n plus p equal to the right hand side. What is the right hand side? Minus x squared y that is minus sigma n from 0 to infinity a n x to the power n plus p plus 2. Put n plus 2 equal to capital N. So, you get sigma n from 2 to infinity a n minus 2 x to the power n plus p. Is this correct? Is this clear? Any questions so far? No questions. So, when n equal to 0, so, so right hand side is starting from where? Starting from n equal to 2. So, when n equal to 0, there will be nothing, no contribution from the right hand side, only left hand side. But what is the left hand side contributing? p squared minus p squared a naught nothing, n equal to give 0 gives you nothing, n equal to 1 gives you p plus 1 squared minus p squared a 1 equal to 0. Remember our p was positive, remember p was positive. So, that will give you a 1 is 0, that will force you to take a 1 to be 0, no choice. n greater than or equal to 2 is more interesting both terms, both the left hand side and the right hand side contribute. The left hand side contributes n into n plus 2 p from here a n. Right hand side gives you minus a n minus 2, which is the recursion relation. When you solve a second order O d, linear O d with variable coefficients, you get a recursion relation, right, which normally takes this form. Same similar recursion relations will be there when you solve the Legendre, Chebyshev, Laguerre, hypergeometric, 
all those things the recursion relation and you can you know a naught is arbitrary a 1 is 0 moment a 1 is 0 a 3 will be 0 because put n equal to 3 put n equal to 3 something times a 3 equal to 0. So, a 3 is 0. Similarly, a 5 will be 0, a 7 will be 0. So, all the odd uh, a, a 2 n plus 1 will be 0, all the odd coefficients will be 0, correct. Is it clear? Questions? How the recursion formula comes about? No. May we proceed? Right. So, odd ones are all 0 now even ones you have to put it and see a 2 equal to minus a naught upon 2 into 2 plus 2 p. You write down the recursion relation please, write down the recursion relation n into n plus 2 p a n because you will be able to follow me if you write it down n into n plus 2 p a n equal to minus a n minus 2. right. So, what do you get? You now put n equal to 2, 4, 6, 8 etcetera and get a 2, a 4, a 6 in succession. So, let us do that a 2 equal to minus a naught upon 2 into 2 plus 2 p, a 4 equal to minus a 2 upon 4 into 4 plus 2 p, a 6 is minus a 4 upon 6 plus 6 plus 6 into 6 plus 2 p correct. But then now a 2 has been obtained from the previous one put that in. So, a 4 is a naught upon 2 into 4 2 plus 2 p 4 plus 2 p a 6 is minus a 4 upon 6 into 6 plus 2 p, but a 4 from the previous one gives you minus a naught upon 2 4 6 2 plus 2 p 4 plus 2 p 6 plus 2 p and so it goes. The law of formation is very clear a 2 k is minus 1 to the power k a naught 2 into 4 into 6 will be 2 to the power k k factorial a 2 2 2 comes out of each of the uh, each of these parentheses and you get 2 to the power 2 k in all. So, you get k factorial p plus 1 p plus 2 p plus k and so the solution is written down a naught x to the power p summation n from 0 to infinity minus 1 to the power n. What is this string here p plus 1 p plus 2 p plus k gamma p plus 1 upon gamma p plus n plus 1 or p plus k plus 1 in this case k has changed to n correct. Now, you can check that this series has this series power series has infinite radius of convergence. So, term by term differentiation is valid. I can differentiate term by term a, any number of times I can perform the differentiation and I can go back and verify that it will satisfy the differential equation because these coefficients have been formed out of the recursion formula. Correct. So, you do indeed get a solution which behaves like x to the power p in the neighborhood of 0, correct. Now, if p is not an integer, then by this process you do get two linearly independent solutions, fine. When p equal to 0, you cannot possibly get two solutions because 0 is a repeated root, correct. Now, when p is a positive integer, we have found one solution, we might think that the second solution will be obtained this by the using the same formula. Life is not so simple, unfortunately. The second solution will simply become a multiple of the first solution, that is a problem. We cannot, we do not get two solutions, but let us not uh, worry about that, we got at least one solution, let us be happy about it. is a second order OD. So, there will be two linearly independent solutions. 
the a naught is arbitrary so far a naught is arbitrary so far so now that we make a special choice a naught equal to 1 over 2 to the power p gamma p plus 1 this is a normalization this is the choice of a naught with this choice of a naught the solution that we got is simply this sigma n from 0 to infinity minus 1 to the power n x to the power 2 n plus p upon 2 to the power 2 n plus p you have picked up an additional p here because of this a naught and the gamma p plus 1 which was in the numerator goes away and you get this this particular solution is called jpx bessel's function of the first kind bessel's function of the first kind all right so now our purpose is now to study these functions jpx in detail we want to understand the uh, jpx in great detail okay so we already made some observations that when p is not an integer jpx and j minus px will be two linearly independent solutions when p is an integer you don't get two linearly independent solutions but you still get one of them that will be the jnx for integer values of n and later on we are going to be interested only in the integer values of p we are only going to be interested in jnx for integer n okay but meanwhile it's an exercise for you to prove that j half x write down these two things show that j half x equal to root 2 by pi j half x equal to j sub half j subscript half okay here it is j half x equal to root 2 upon pi sin x upon root x j minus half x equal to root 2 upon pi cos x upon root x you need to write the jpx here is jpx for you jpx is sigma 0 n from 0 to infinity minus 1 to the power n x to the power 2 n plus p upon 2 to the power 2 n plus p and then the, in the denominator you have n factorial gamma n plus p plus 1 the gamma function appears in the definition of the Bessel's function correct write down this definition and verify that j half of x is root 2 upon pi sin x upon root x and j minus half x is root 2 upon pi cos x upon root x right shall we proceed okay now you have that now i am going to give you a list of easy exercises please do them they are pretty easy and it is essential that you do these things okay now the term by term differentiation is valid because it is a power series with infinite radius of convergence without the x to the power p of course Ch write down 1 2 3 4 these four lines problem number 3 you do not have to write down you can you can just read it if you like and the most important are the third line and the fourth line these are the things that we are going to use and to ex do exercise 3 you need exercise 1 and 2 how do you prove this you simply differentiate the power series term by term and you just verify uh, your verifications nothing else okay so we see that we have come already a long way 
in understanding j p x between two successive zeros of j n x, there is a zero of j n minus 1 and a zero of j n plus 1. Already have some information about the zeros, then the zeros interlace, this is very typical of solutions of second order ODs. Yes, yes, the Rolle's theorem, the Rolle's theorem, Rolle's theorem and the, the, this, the, this one, these two, yeah. All right. Okay, now there are a few other obvious, a uh, few other obvious, uh, what do you want? Which one? The last one. Okay. Now, there are a few obvious things. Now, if n is an integer and if n is an odd integer, then j n x is an odd function. If n is an even integer, then j n x is an even function. Because in the power series, only odd powers will appear or only even powers will appear. That is the reason. So, if n is odd, j n is odd. If n is even, j n is even. That is a simply an observation, direct observation, correct? You do not have to write it down, I mean it is just an observation, I mean it is absolutely trivial. Now, let us do something which appears to be pretty boring, but let us get it out. We want some information as to how big is J m x, why do we need it, we will see later. But what we are, what I am going to prove now is a crude estimate, very crude estimate. So, first what is j m x? j m x involves x to the power 2 n plus m, 2 to the power 2 n plus m, right? 1 over n factorial gamma n plus m plus 1, minus 1 to the power m go, uh, n goes away because I have taken the absolute value. Is it clear? The first one, the very first one. Now, multiply and divide by 2 n plus m factorial, multiply and divide by 2 n plus 1 fact, uh, 2 n plus m factorial. So, this business here is a binomial coefficient, correct? That is a binomial coefficient. What is that? 2 n plus m choose n, correct? Now, you know that n choose r is less than or equal to 2 to the power n, correct? 1 plus 1 to the power n, you expand by the binomial theorem, you will get that n choose r is less than or equal to 2 to the power n. So, this divided by 2 to the power 2 n plus m cancels out and it is less than or equal to 1. So, I can just forget about these two things and I am simply left with mod x to the power 2n plus m upon 2n plus m factorial. Pull out the mod x to the power m outside and put an m factorial and multiply by m factorial. Now, 2n plus m factorial is what? 2n factorial into 2n plus 1, 2n plus 2, 2n plus 3, 2n plus m. Product of n successive integers beyond 2n and m factorial is the product of the first m successive in, uh, m integers. So, the ratio is going to be less than 1, right? 1 into 2 into 3 into m divided by 2 n plus 1, 2 n plus 2, 2 n plus m, that is going to be less than 1, obviously. So, I can say that it is less than or equal to x to the power m upon m factorial sigma n from 0 to infinity x to the power 2 n upon 2 n factorial and this is clearly less than the exponential function e to the power mod x. That is exactly what we wanted to prove. So, we got some information about j m x. In particular, it is a function of exponential type. It is a function of exponential type. You can compute its Laplace transforms, for instance. That is not bad. Huh? That is good information. All right. That is, of course, uh, important, just write the estimate mod j m x less than or equal to, write the, write the estimate mod j m x less than or equal to mod x to the power m upon m factorial e to the power mod x, correct? 
Well, what do you do with this estimate? We want to not find the Laplace transform, we will do something else. Laplace transform is over. The series, we are going to construct a series, the generating function. When I get a sequence, I will look at the generating function. Sigma n from 0 to infinity j n x t to the power n converges uniformly with respect to x over every bounded interval. So, if I construct this series, this series converges uniformly. Why, do we, why does it converge uniformly? Take the absolute value, use the estimate and apply Weierstrass's m test. Directly you will get the uniform convergence. All right. Here a stress t is fixed and x varies over a closed bounded interval. And then when j minus n x, I am going to define, I am going to define it to be minus 1 to the power n j n x. This is a convenience. I want the values of j n for negative n also, but I define it to be this way. Remember when n is an integer, j minus n is not going to give you a second solution. I made that comment earlier. So, I take it to be minus 1 to the power n times j n x. It is going to be a multiple of the first one and it is going to be some multiple and I can always normalize it and I can always take it, take it, take this as a different. Verify that these identities continue to hold even when, even when n is negative. So, now let us take stock of the situation. We have the Bessel's OD, we found a series solution in the form x to the power p times the power series. There is an a naught which is arbitrary. We specialized a naught and we got a special function. That special function is called j p x, it is called the Bessel's function of the first kind a very important functions and we are going to study this function in detail. And already we have a few simple properties. Between two successive zeros of j p, there is a 0 of j p plus 1 and there is a 0 of j p minus 1. And then there are two, there are identities connecting j p, j p plus 1 and j p minus 1. There are two such identities, one involving j p and one involving j p prime, correct. These two identities are exceedingly important all properties of Bessel's functions will somehow use these two basic relationships between j p, j p plus 1 and j, j p minus 1. How many relations are there? There are two relations. You have written down those two relations. Tomorrow, we are going to der derive a remarkable formula called the Schlomilch formula. From Schlomilch formula, we will be able to extract a another representation for j, j, j n x. So far our j n x is an infinite series and working with an infinite series is clumsy. What we are going to derive tomorrow is an integral formula for j n x. We are going to prove that j n x is 1 over pi integral 0 to pi cos of sin theta minus n theta d theta. We are going to derive this tomorrow. This was Bessel's original definition of the function that bear his name. And we will finish this off in 20 minutes at most. And the rest of the time, we are going to look at an application of Bessel's function to a problem in celestial mechanics. Until tomorrow, you know, to, for what, what is that problem in celestial mechanics? You have to tune in tomorrow and if you remain absent, you lose the fun, you will miss out on the fun. Okay? All right, we will close here and we will meet in the afternoon for the tutorial class and tomorrow will be the last lecture and we will complete this, our discussion of the Bessel's function and we will with an application. All right?